Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Roland Green, director of the Stanford Humanities Center. And like everyone here, I'm pleased to welcome you to our virtual home. Today's conversation is presented as part of our Inside the Center series, which highlights the research and writing of our current and recent fellows, some of the provocative work that is happening at the SHC. Thank you for being with us today. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that real-time captioning is available. Please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom where it says CC to start or stop viewing the captioning. The up arrow adjacent to the CC icon permits you to show subtitles, uh, view the full transcript, and adjust captions as needed. Since 2019, when I took on the role of director of this center and continuing through and despite the pandemic, one of my priorities was and has been to reinforce our distinctive office at Stanford as a research institute with public facing programs. The SHC is unusual among university based humanities centers in that we both house a large number of fellows working on their own projects. This year we have nearly 50 working under our roof and we present events like this one that are open to everyone. The work of the fellows, we hope, is enlivened by the visiting speakers, while the visitors encounter an audience that includes not only Stanford people, scholars, and students, but many others who've met here for the year. At some point, the research conceived or realized at the SHC gets published or otherwise made public, and that's what we're celebrating right now, new work by a former fellow. As a former fellow myself, I find it um, uh, uh, maybe the word I'm looking for is encouraging that we've developed a medium for hearing about people's current projects, which may sometimes start from a seed that was planted five, 10 or more years ago at the SHC. Inside the Center is one of several series we've launched over the past two and a half years, and we intend to keep providing events of similar quality and diversity. One more note before I introduce our speakers. I'd like to remind you that today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website in the coming days. Also, if you'd like to submit a question to the speaker, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and we will do our best to get to it following the, uh, the, the conversation. Susan Gilman, who was a fellow here in the 1994 academic year, is Distinguished Professor of Literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's the author of two wonderful books, Dark Twins, Imposture and Identity in Mark Twain's America, which appeared in 1989, and Blood Talk, American Race Melodrama and the Culture of the Occult, 2003, both from the University of Chicago Press. She has worked collaboratively on several essay collections, most recently, Neither the Time Nor the Place, Today's 19th Century, which appeared from uh, Penn Press uh, about a year ago. Today, we're here to celebrate the launch of Susan Gilman's new book, American Mediterraneans, um, a study in geography, uh, history, and race, again from Chicago. The book traces the strange career of the American Mediterranean, a geohistorical metaphor used in multiple disciplines, genres, and languages as a point of departure for a transnational and translational study of the Americas. Joining her in conversation will be current SHC fellow David Kazanjian, professor of English and comparative literature at the University of Pennsylvania, and author most recently of The Brink of Freedom, Improvising Life in the 19th Century Atlantic World, which appeared in 2016, and Camilla Hawthorne, assistant professor of sociology and critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. Professor Hawthorne is the author of Contesting Race and Citizenship, Youth Politics in the Black Mediterranean, forthcoming very soon, and co-editor of The Black Mediterranean Bodies, Borders, and Citizenship, which appeared two years ago. Now, today's event includes not only these three speakers, but a blog post by Christian Hoegsberg of the University of Brighton titled CLR James's Black Spartacus and the Mediterranean, which may be found on the homepage of the SHC's site known as Arcade. That's at Arcade stanford.edu. If you go to that site today, you'll find this item at the top of the homepage and we'll put a direct link in the chat. If you're watching this video a week or a month from today, just go to the Arcade homepage and search for Black Spartacus. Professor Hoegsberg is an important scholar of the Black Atlantic intellectual CLR James. He wrote the post for this occasion. 
Shortly, the same site, Arcade, will introduce a gathering of materials related to the topic of Susan Gilman's book under the title Mediterraneans, a cluster that will grow over time and to which anyone may propose new materials, whether print, online, or otherwise. The aim of such a cluster, which we call a colloquy, is to extend today's conversation into the future. So without further ado, Susan, David, Camilla, thank you for joining us today. Take it away. First and foremost, huge thanks to everyone at the Humanities Center for making this happen, especially Bob Cable, Eric Ortiz, Victoria Zarita, who's responsible for the uh, arcade colloquy, and Roland Green, who has, is the master MC of all of it. Um, here's the game plan for what, what we'll do today. Um, each of the three of us, my co-conversationalist, Camila, Hawthorne, David Kazanjan, and I will speak for about seven minutes about the book and our responses to it. Um, then we'll have a three-way conversation briefly based on our views of the book, including my own now that it's finished. Um, and then we will open up everything to the rest of our conversationalists, and that is you. Um, so let me start without ado. Um, the Mediterranean has long existed as a geographic region, an economic space, and a political imaginary. But the plural Mediterraneans of my title point to, as Roland said, the strange career of a folk geographical concept, not at all a household word in the US today, but that term American Mediterranean in French, Spanish, and English once circulated widely and erratically, referring to different places, appearing and disappearing, sometimes just in titles, footnotes, and epigraphs across disciplines and genres, spaces, and times. My starting point is Alexander von Humboldt, the celebrated Prussian naturalist who coined the term Méditerranée de l'Amérique in 1804, referring to the Gulf Caribbean. He also called it Méditerranée des Antilles, Méditerranée Mexicaine, and others followed with other places and names, not really translations per se, either literal or loose, but rather cognates. And here's just a sampling of them. The French anarchist geographer, Elise Reclus, Méditerranée Américaine. The Cuban Alejo Carpentier, Méditerranéo Caribe. The Jamaican nationalist who was also in exile in New York City, W. Adolph Roberts, Mediterranean of the West. And then not to mention the Pacific Caribbean, the Pacific Mediterranean, excuse me. Um, those terms would be Mediterranean shores of America, colon, Southern California, and Puget Sound, the American Mediterranean. All of those, and they don't exhaust by any means the names, point to the patchwork and protean history of Mediterranean terminology, multiple asymmetrical recurrences, which help us, I think, to ask the question that the book is interested in, why in the Americas so many bodies of water and land are so frequently compared to the Euro-Mediterranean, both classical and modern? There are two especially high octane moments when and where American Mediterraneans and their corresponding geolocations found that special purchase. One is 19th century geographers and writers of the 1890s who reflect on the Pacific world of Southern California. And one centerpiece of that network would be Helen Hunt Jackson's 1884 novel, Ramona, which spawned a Spanish colonial revival in art and architecture, which was also known as AKA, a Mediterranean revival. She also spawned a series of afterlives in California state names, which many of you who are from California will know, downtown Palo, Palo Alto features a Ramona Street. The second high octane moment, literary writers and activists of the 1930s and 40s take on the political past and future of the Gulf Caribbean. They adapt Mediterranean thinking as a form of anti-colonial thinking. What they do is look back from Jose Marti's 1888 translation of Jackson's novel, Ramona, to a network of writers and thinkers 
including Fernando Ortiz of Cuban Counterpoint, Carpentier, Du Bois, and CLR James, as well as Roberts, uh, and U.S. Southern novelists, James Street, who you won't have heard of, and William Faulkner, who you will have. All of these grapple in one way or another with American legacies of European imperialism and slavery, as those histories give shape to different racial struggles, coalitions, and possibilities. That strange career, which I'm calling it that in homage to C. Van Woodward's work in 1955 on Jim Crow, also reveals an understudied, if not quite hidden history, um, how attention to geographical place morphed into assumptions about race. Here, George Lip Lipsitz's work on the racialization of space and the spatialization of race would come in. Following out this American Mediterranean history of race and place, licenses and even requires, happily, juggling multidisciplines, which were then still in the process of separating out into their specialized spheres. One example would be climatology as a subset of the emerging environmental determinism, which was at the time touted by its proponents um, as a would-be antidote to biogenetic race. Um, that world, that view of two different emerging disciplines produced conflicting and provisional outcomes that the Mediterranean, um, thinking of the American Mediterranean will make visible. Charles Dudley Warner, Twain's co-author on the, the satire, The Gilded Age, wrote the best-selling 1891 Our Italy on Southern California as a Our Mediterranean, Our Italy, exclamation point, a travel and health destination, a sanitized, as he called it, semi-tropical Mediterranean without malaria. The semi indicating supposedly without its tropical, meaning racial disadvantages, and that would be the triple threat, fecundity, enervation, disease. Later in the same network, California, attempting to marry geography and history, Ellen Churchill Semple, who was often called Miss Semple, elected in 1921 as the first woman president of the Amer Association of American Geographers, and Frederick Jackson Turner, who of course you will have heard of, formed an unlikely partnership they aim to join disciplinary forces at the 1907 American Historical Association annual meeting around their mutual interest in geohistory. Her American Mediterranean was oriented to the Pacific in a 1903 book called American History and Its Geographical Conditions, and his, of course, to the frontier. That's just a few of the cast of characters in this book, the celebrated and the neglected. They speak for what I found, a history that deserves to be better known, at once long lasting and short lived, raced and putatively colorblind, oceanic and landed, imperial and revolutionary, material and metaphoric. The Mediterranean as a disorderly signifier of place, time, displacement and atemporality is the bottom line and I hope a provocation for thought. So, to take the provocation idea, take one of the outliers, the most far out Mediterraneanizers in my book, who neither uses the term nor the concept, CLR James, in principle had the motive and the opportunity to do so. He wrote his history of the Haitian revolution, the Black Jacobins in 1938, when he made 1790s Saint-Domingue, a predictor of world decolonization, a forecast of the future of colonial Africa, post-World War II, and in a second edition of Black Jacobins from 1963, he extends that prediction to Castro's Cuba. Um, but from this perspective of the American Mediterranean, he belonged to one of those high octane moments, the Gulf Caribbean 1930s and 40s, when the ideal of a collective Caribbean identity, also called Antillanité, um, re-emerged earlier under the aegis of Jose Marti, that's a lineage that Glissant um, often mentions. Um, and he circulated, James circulated in relative proximity to other players at this time, Ortiz, Robert Césaire, um, Carpentier. So without any other evidence of contact, James, for James to be a conscript of Mediterrane Mediterraneity, um, he needs some form of speculative thinking, 
to use one of his own phrases, to be included as a Mediterraneanizer. But why, I'll end almost with, would James's The Black Jacobins either need or fit an American Mediterranean frame? Itself, a speculative counterfactual, really, a real counterfactual take on the comparative, the American Mediterranean frame highlights James's own speculative comparative practice. I'm thinking of all the Black Jacobins, Black Spartacuses, Bonaparte Noir, and Black Robespierre's in his book, all of them in one way or another, two cents. Thinking as a Mediterraneanizer links James's two cent to the classical Mediterranean world, so that as he puts it at one point in the book, it's no wonder that Toussaint came in the end to think of himself as the black Spartacus. And thinking through Mediterraneanism, Mediterraneanism highlights the translational aspect of James's Toussaint, especially the question of his names, which James includes in a footnote. Um, as a slave, he was called Toussaint Breda. So from Breda to Louverture, he becomes his assumed name, literally opening. Also later in the same large network, the 1980s, 90s, there's an off-quoted Lissant line, each Caribbean island is, he says, an opening. The Caribbean, an estuary of the Americas, he says, a sea that explodes in contrast to the Mediterranean, which is a sea of unity, an inner sea that concentrates. So my fondest hope is that my book is just that, an opening out onto other Mediterraneans, other times and places. Um, for that reason, the book is bookended by another unlikely, another odd couple, um, Humboldt and Braudel. Um, to the end of bringing this into the real world, as opposed to the book, uh, the book world, I've been talking since last summer with Camila about her work on the contemporary Black Mediterranean. And in just one lunchtime at the center, at least one more fugitive Mediterranean came out at the table. And that is David's essay in a collection wonderfully entitled An Armenian Mediterranean. Um, this conversation with Camila and David will be the first real world means to that end. And now Victoria, please do the slider if you can. Um, and the new, as Ro Roland said, the new San Stanford Humanities Center arcade colloquy called Mediterraneans is another future of this, uh, of this book outside of the book itself. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to make it totally open-ended in terms of readers, disciplines, and technologies. There's the blog that Roland mentioned. Um, and then there are, she will show us in a minute, this is the, the top page. There is a slider in which all of the illustrations that I have collected in my book, plus some that I didn't have, are recreated on a slider with hovering captions. The captions, which are in the boxes down below, the dots down below, feature the captions which tell the story of the book as a whole in a different way, um, a visual way paying homage as the gallery does of illustrations in the book to the highly visual nature of the work on American Mediterranean. Now the best test of the book's success is whether you, the audience, are sold on this way of reading the strange on again, off again career of the American Mediterranean. It's an unruly counterfactual comparative if there ever was one, but beyond simply the application of or a corrective to a classical European model. It's both the talking back and an opening out onto future worlds elsewhere, all the other possible Mediterraneans known and unknown. The wager here is to read my book, not only as a Jeremiah, a warning, geo-historical metaphors have often served as quasi-scientific projections of a Western right to conquest, but also inspiration, speculating on alternative revolutionary futures emerging from the unfinished business of the past, all brought together under the umbrella set, the banner of the American Mediterraneans. Next, Camila. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you so much. And 
Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm immediately reminded um, about something that Stuart Hall said about the West, but I think we can also use to think about the Mediterranean. Um, Stuart Hall described the West not as a geographical referent, but as an historical construct. And I think that, you know, the, the line of continuity between the many different Mediterraneans um, that we're talking about today are, you know, the kind of shifting fluid historical constructions of these Mediterraneans. So I come to Susan's work as a scholar of uh, another of these multiple Mediterraneans, the Black Mediterranean. Um, Black Mediterranean studies is an emerging field that considers the production of Blackness and the distinct contours of Black subjectivity in Mediterranean Europe, the erasure of Black histories and the dense networks of cultural creolization that link Africa and Europe, and the practices by which Africans in African diasporas in Italy and Southern Europe engage with and expand the, the circuits of global Blackness. And as an analytic, the Black Mediterranean is focused on linking Sub-Saharan Africa to the wider Mediterranean basin, past and present, from the historical connections between Nubia and Egypt to um, the violent migration control regimes that characterize today's migration control collaborations between North African states and fortress Europe. And much like Susan's work, this emerging literature on the Black Mediterranean de-romanticizes the Mediterranean, right? No longer is the Mediterranean a kind of convenient stand-in for temperate climates and healthy diets, um, but it's a, a powerful site of racial boundary drawing. As she writes in the introduction to the book, the Mediterranean metaphor is always in part about race, even when it appears not to be. In the case of the Black Mediterranean, centering these irrepressible connections between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean can also facilitate a critical rethinking of modernity itself by challenging the separation between Sub-Saharan African Blackness and the imaginary of the Mediterranean as the cauldron within which a presumably white European civilization was produced. In Italy, where I do the majority of my work, the Mediterranean has long served as a racial referent in the tenuous process of nation building in ways that have global reverberations. Much like the racial geographies that Susan describes in American Mediterraneans, politicians and scientists of liberal Italy um, around the time of national unification attempted to use racial science to secure Italy's membership as part of Europe and resolve the questions raised by Italy's geographical position at the border of Europe and Africa. Italian elites strove to access European modernity through the production of scientific knowledge using climatology, physiognomy, anthropology, criminology, and so on. Um, and specifically through the production of scientific knowledge that mapped Italy as unambiguously European, either by bracketing Southern Italy as outside the civilizational boundaries of Italianness, or alternatively by asserting the Afro-Mediterranean origins of all European civilizations in the case of Giuseppe Sergi. Most European nation states at the time traced their cultural and political origins to ancient Rome, locating the cradle of European civilization within the Italian peninsula. But intellectuals of Northern Europe, influenced by Aryanist or Nordicist racial theories um, that focus on racial purity, looked down on contemporary Italians due to their proximity to the African continent via the Mediterranean. For example, de Gobineau famously contended that the Aryan racial origins of the Roman Empire, that despite the Aryan racial origins of the Roman Empire, its collapse could be traced to the decadence and racial degeneration caused by Aryan Romans indiscriminate intermixing with African and Asians. This problem of racial equivocality was further exacerbated by liberal Italy's colonial expansion into the Horn of Africa. So as such, Italy was part of a global system of race thinking and racial science in the 19th and 20th centuries, even preceding fascism, embedded in transnational networks of scientific knowledge production that, for example, used the black female body as the material grounds for establishing and contesting the boundaries of racial national identity and citizenship. Cesare Lombroso, who today is considered the founder of modern criminology and is perhaps Italy's most famous and prolific homegrown racial theorist, had in his collections a painting of Sarah Bartman, otherwise known as the hot and taut Venus, even though she was never brought to Italy. Nonetheless, it was through his visual dissection of her body and, her, and its comparison with the body of Italian sex workers through a set of pan-Mediterranean comparisons that he penned theories of atavism and criminality that mapped Italianness based on relative distance or proximity from Mediterraneanness and Blackness. <laughs> 
And of course, Lombroso's ideas reverberated across the Atlantic, even to the United States, where his arguments and those of his acolytes influenced the intertwined racialization of Italians and Black Americans and were used to justify restrictions on Italian immigration to the United States, right? So once again, we're seeing the interconnectedness of these many Mediterraneans. So on the one hand, the Mediterranean has been a locus of engagement, exchange, and cultural fluorescence for thousands of years. But on the other hand, it has been a center of economic extraction, racist violence, and imperial ambition. Right Today, the Mediterranean is immediately recognizable as the symbol of Fortress Europe's brutal border regimes. And so for that reason, right, I want to return to the connection that Susan draws between, in her book between the Mediterranean and the Caribbean, right? The Mediterranean and the Caribbean share many geographical, political, and econo uh, economic and social characteristics. But there are ways to read this connection against the grain of Humboldt's American Mediterranean. Right. Most strikingly, both seas are upheld as spaces of interconnection that have been profoundly shaped by processes of mixing, hybridity, metissage, or creolization. But these histories in both cases are inextricable from extreme forms of racial capitalist and gendered violence. And just as the writings of intellectuals uh, from CLR James to Fanon to Winter emerged from a moment of political emancipation across the global African diaspora, the current unfolding of Black Mediterranean politics has been shaped by emancipatory visions intended to challenge the different forms of racist violence unfolding along Europe's southern shores. So what sorts of transgressive knowledges from the Caribbean can be made to measure of the contemporary Mediterranean? The Caribbean and its relationship to the Black radical tradition have provided ways to provincialize linear diffusionist stories of racial capitalist modernity. Thinkers from Sidney Mintz to Edwidge Danticat have attempted to reorient world history on the islands of the Caribbean, places where phenomena we think of as belonging to our own age, mass migration and mass industry and transcontinental trade um, have been facts of life for centuries. According to CLR James's 1963 appendix to the Black Jacobins, which of course, Susan, you just referenced, right? James argues that the brutal racial political economy based on the transnational sugar, sugar trade thrust enslaved Black folk into a life that was in its essence a modern life. Just as Gilroy later crafted a counter narrative of modernity based in the foundational violence of the trans transatlantic slave trade in the Black Atlantic, James's location of modernity in the particular socioeconomic relations of the 17th century West Indies has become central to anti and post colonial claims about modernity and the position of black life within the West liberalism and capitalism. But what happens when we reorient the story once again, this time to the Mediterranean or again to multiple Mediterraneans? This doesn't mean succumbing to the historiographical retconning that constructed the Mediterranean of antiquity as the cradle of white Christian civilization. Um, rather, it means acknowledging that the Mediterranean Sea, like the Caribbean and the Atlantic, can serve as one of many rhizomatic starting points for telling different kinds of stories about modernity, racial capitalism, and even blackness itself. So again, right, returning to Glissant, um, Glissant describes the Caribbean archipelago as emblematic of relation. And Susan, as you just said, he explicitly contrasts the Caribbean as sort of exploding outwards and the Mediterranean as a sea that concentrates. But I want to suggest that in an expansive and perhaps reparative reading of Glissant, we can think about the Mediterranean differently, not as an empty expanse that's hemmed in by land, but as full of contradictory and interrelated meanings, placemaking practices, subjectivities, and struggle. For Glissant, the Mediterranean's almost claustrophobic geography is generative of monotheistic religions, ontologies of boundedness, and the overwhelming will to annihilate difference. But we can also read the Mediterranean as a site of relation, another explosive archipelago of porosity that throws into question the pretension of unitary and totalitarian identities and histories. So just to wrap up, I'll say that the last decade has wit uh, last decade and a half has witnessed a resurgence in, of interest, um, academic and popular interest in the Mediterranean as a geographical unit of analysis. 
um, at an historical conjuncture marked by the rise of xenophobic separatist far-right political parties, um, the decline of naval search and rescue programs in the Mediterranean and their replacement with border securitization efforts, skyrocketing death, skyrocketing death tolls in the Mediterranean, um, and the right-wing demonization of aid ships, um, and progressively restrictive regulations on the acquisition of citizenship, intellectuals and activists have sought to reimagine the Mediterranean otherwise. And so in this context, I want to argue that we can no longer think about the Black Mediterranean as just a defunct precondition for racial capitalism, a racial capitalist order centered on the North Atlantic, um, nor can we approach the dynamics of the contemporary Mediterranean as just derivative of Black Atlantic afterlives of slavery, but instead it's urgent for us to think about the ongoing reproductions of the Black Mediterranean in the present, as along with all of its ongoing nonlinear articulations with other Mediterraneans, as well as the Black Atlantic and the Black Pacific and the Black Indian Ocean. Thank you. Great, fantastic, uh, Camilla, thanks so much for that. Um, so I'm David Kazanjan, uh, Susan and I are joining you, uh, in case you were wondering from my office here at the Humanities Center, um, and we thought it would be nice to have some of us in the same room anyway. Um, so thanks uh, to uh, the Humanities Center, to Roland, to Eric, and the whole staff here for putting this together, and uh, to Susan for uh, inviting me along. Um, what a thrill to be able to read this book, Caught Off the Presses, and uh, to be able to think about it. Susan's one of the people who uh, many years ago inspired me to study the early Americas, so it's a special treat to be here. Um, uh, another person who inspired me to do that is uh, the person to whom you dedicate the book, uh, Amy Kaplan. So I felt like we got to invoke her. Um, we lost Amy a couple of years ago, almost two years ago now, and uh, and she, I know, is, would be here, but is also probably here somehow uh, for both of us, at the very least. Um, so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about the method of um, Susan's book here um, in ways that I think will uh, build on what we've already heard. Um, and I'm looking at a monitor right here that has my comments on it, so if I'm looking a little bit here, uh, that's what's going on on this end. <laughs> So American Mediterraneans seeks out to rediscover the history of its eponymous term to speculate on the cultural work that term does across space, time, and language, work that is always fundamentally, if not openly, racial. As Susan explains, quote, I propose to take the history of American Mediterranean nomenclature and thinking as a mode of comparison against the grain rather than the usual discrete nominally parallel units of comparative history, this is something else, a loose framework attuned to the asymmetrical power relation of putting together uneven, often unequal places, times, and languages." End quote. What's most exciting to me is uh, that this is decidedly not a comparativist project, uh, as the robust critique of Fernand Bradell in the final chapter makes really clear. Rather, I think I want to call it a paleonymic project, um, drawing on Jacques Derrida's notion of paleonomy, the borrowing of old terms to invest them with new meanings, moves, or modes. Writes Derrida, quote, what then is the strategic necessity that requires the occasional maintenance of an old name in order to launch a new concept? The name being maintained acts as a kind of lever of intervention in order to maintain a grasp on the previous organization, which is to be effectively transformed." End quote. So paleonomy goes on to explain works by extraction, graft, and then extension. So let's take these three moves one at a time, extraction, graft, and extension. Susan has extracted this old term, American Mediterranean, from the colonial era, notably from the early main century work of German uh, naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, where it functioned to mark both the similarities and the differences between the so-called old and the so-called new worlds. This extraction is strategically necessarily necessary, she meticulously uh, shows uh, in the introduction, because Humboldt's use of the term offers, quote, a mode of critique a method with a particular skeptical and hypothetical take on the comparative that is at the very heart of the idea of comparing the European Mediterranean 
with various American correlatives, end quote. So even in Humboldt, we can see in action the terms critical force, and thus the justification for revisiting and extracting it. Quoting again from Susan's book, in contrast to unidirectional Western progression, Humboldt's translational perspective continually looks back and forth between worlds. He pushes back against the grain of classical Mediterraneanism and assume, its assumed continental thinking to the invention of America that has yet to be identified still in the future, end quote. Put another way, Susan crisply explains, quote, Humboldt's American Mediterraneans rediscovered Europe as much as they invented America, end quote. So second, Susan has then grafted this old term, American Mediterranean, onto a decidedly contemporary project, the move beyond comparison and comparativism, given that method's thorough implication in colonialist, imperialist, and racist projects, and toward an attention to plural, irreconcilable, unfinished, yet potent flashpoints from our past or perhaps we should call them eddies, archipelagos, and even shoals, in a nod to Tiffany Lethabo King. That is, the unfinished yet ongoing work of Black, Latinx, Indigenous people throughout the Americas, whose struggles and strivings are connected in ways we have only barely been able to see. As Susan just said in her remarks, she's after openings onto alternative revolutionary futures emerging from the unfinished business of the past. So letting that graft take hold and grow, Susan has finally extended this old term, American Mediterranean, to track a critical impulse in three historical and textual flashpoints overflowing with those struggles and strivings. First, 19th century geographers of the Americas. Second, 1890s travel and touristic literature on California. And third, accounts of the Gulf Coast and Caribbean from the 1940s. With each extension in time and into texts, the term reveals more potent consequences for its critical force. We learn to spot the study of human environmental interaction in scholars like Ellen Churchill Semple's 19th century geographies. We learn to spot the traces of not entirely lost indigenous and Spanish place names in late 19th century California travel literature. And uh, we learned to spot the splendid failures, the unfinished revolutions of the past as unrealized predictors of the future waiting to be activated from the work of CLR James, Roberto Fernandez Retamar, and Jose Martin. So extraction, graft, extension. Susan's paleonymic work with the term American Mediterraneans roots out untapped possibilities, roads not yet taken in the Bradellian world. So I'd like to get you, Susan, to talk a little bit more uh, about the reasons for and consequences of this project, if you accept this kind of the paleonymic uh, elements of it I'm zeroing in on. What specifically do you see uh, as the main strategic necessity, again, quoting from Derrida, for moving away from comparativism and toward Mediterraneanism, as it were? In other words, like, why this term right now? Um, or maybe a better question is a more genealogical one. How do our current times call for this methodological move? If we take American Mediterraneans as something like what Derrida calls a lever of invention, intervention, can you talk about what it intervenes in and what it might kind of pry loose for us all today? I also was hoping you could talk uh, or I noticed that you talked a number of times in the book about how the term American Mediterraneans is not as familiar to us today as it once was, right? So I'm interested in this. Like, can you explain how and why you think it died out or went into hibernation? Mm -hmm. and, and in other words, like, what, what does this term no longer translate um, as well as what, it, what did it once translate, right? As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, two of these remarks, um, I was struck by your critique of Braudel in the last chapter. Uh, I th I, I'll say that opting for von Humboldt over Braudel initially seemed like a counterintuitive move to me, and I'll admit I was skeptical at first. 
Um, but you definitely brought me along. So I'd like to give you a chance to explain that kind of that polemical gesture in the best sense of the word polemical of, of thinking with von Humboldt um, even more in some ways than, than with Bradell. I guess at first I was worried that we might lose some of the materialist elements of Bradell's work, uh, which, which themselves were extracted, grafted, and extended by some of the most important critics of, of racial capitalism on a global scale, some of whom Camila mentioned, including Cedric Robinson, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Sylvia Winter, to name just a few. So I guess I'm asking uh, here if you can talk a bit about how we can keep track of materialist concerns like the circulation and, and flows of capital, people and ideas, even as we activate the poetics of the many Mediterraneans you reveal to us. I actually have recently been thinking through the anthropological literature on infrastructure to understand the, the, the material as a way of understanding the material and poetic of roots of circulation uh, at once. So I, I wonder whether you've come across any of that work or if that's an interesting frame for uh, you, um, if you found in it any kindred moves or methods. And of course, as you, as you mentioned, we can talk to you about um, the Armenian Mediterranean um, and that project, uh, which I was a, a small part. So that's it for me. Um, uh, let's turn it over now to the, to the discussion, right? To all of us, yes. Camila, is, we welcome. Um, what can I say other than the openings are so multiple that we really will only be able to scratch the surface. Um, both Camila and David have really laid out um, different worlds that emerge from this very same view of, of one set of plural Mediterraneans. And that really is the ideal. That, that's the, that really is what I hope the book can do. So let's, let me start. Um, David posed some questions, and I think Camila in, implicitly um, posed some questions. But if you have any over, you know, explicit ones, just jump right in. Let me sure. Start yeah. With, you, go ahead now. Yeah, I I did have I did have one question. Um, I, you know, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about how you know what you call the the strange career of the American Mediterraneans, how it helps us think in different ways about the, the global history of racial capitalism and slavery, right? So again, I'm thinking about people like CLR James and Cedric Robinson who are making this argument about the connection between slavery and capitalist modernity. And Cedric Robinson in particular makes a set of arguments about the roots of the sl transatlantic slave trade in Mediterranean slavery, which as I'm finding, right, is often quite a controversial claim, right, among Mediterranean historians in particular, who kind of note that the structure of Mediterranean slavery is quite different. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to you kind of what, what we can learn from thinking all of these different histories together, or even sort of what's at stake in drawing together these different histories of slavery across different Mediterraneans. Like, what does that, what does that tell us? Okay, I, I think it just let and break right in, you know you will. I think both um, Camila and David are asking a similar question, which is why the American Mediterraneans now at this point? Um, and the strange career, just to start there and then to try to address David's question of why rehabilitate it now? You know, what why did it go defunct or underground and why now? The 1955 Strange Career, the thesis of that book was that while it looks like segregation emerged in absolute lockstep following the quote unquote withdrawal of federal troops from the South at the end of Reconstruction, uh, that there were pockets of black political coalition of various kinds of black resistance that existed long after the, um, the end of Reconstruction. And this is the legacy of what Du Bois, another of, I think, the figures who doesn't speak of the American Mediterranean at all, or even of the Mediterranean, but he does speak about global capitalism and the propaganda of history and what we learn and don't learn 
from history. That, that's in, in his magisterial book, also written in the 30s, uh, Black Reconstruction in America. And I think it's that that I'm looking for here to reanimate, or David might have said rehabilitate, you know, all of the rewords, that history of strange zigzags um, in which what looks like a single singular outcome to a racial crisis has multiple competing, conflicting directions that have been suppressed or forgotten or remembered only in uh, siloed ways. And so that, that would be one of the answers to what Camila is asking. Why would you put all of these different things together? Because I think it's that you get from the multiple Mediterraneans, as, as Camila points out, the Mediterranean is the Black Atlantic. It's the Indian Ocean. You know that would be the the way that ocean studies would look at this. But if we look at if this all under the banner of the Mediterranean, I think you really get the racialization. Camila also pointed out the connection that Cedric Robinson makes to the Mediterranean, which none of us would have known about. So, or I certainly did not. And that's part of what I'm interested in here, or what I hope for, is on the Stanford Humanities, you know, just in the world, but that would be a place at the Stanford Humanities Colloquy site, that we can put the new approaches to old worlds that we already know. So where else is the Mediterranean? And in, in, often it can be in these subsidiary places. So Cedric Robinson is not known for a start for making the Mediterranean a connection. I don't know, Camila, where does he do it? Or how? Because I think that would help. Does, where is where is Cedric Camilla. Robinson making this this connection? Would yes. You, yeah. So you know what's so interesting <laughs> about the book Black Marxism, right? Which is you know a, a sort of corrective to a sort of a particular Marxist orientation on a particular kind of revolutionary subject that in order to retell the history of, of global capitalism as a history of racial capitalism, right? Ruth, Ruthie Gilmore always says, you know, racial capitalism is all capitalism, but he goes back to Europe to retell that story. Um, and, I, and I get a lot of inspiration from that in the way that I'm trying to return to the Mediterranean, but not to rehearse it's kind of Eurocentric um, uh, visions of history. And so for Cedric Robinson, he's, arguing that the, the trade and financial networks that were centered in the maritime republics, um, particularly Genoa, um, basically kind of created the capital that then financed Portuguese voyages of discovery across the Atlantic. And so he makes the argument that it was really the Genoese and their investments that set the pace of discovery across the Atlantic. And then the other connection he makes, he says that the use of enslaved labor in sort of agricultural outposts along the islands of the Mediterranean became a template for the use of enslaved labor across, you know, in, in the colonies of the New World. Now, when he does that, right, he and he also notes, right, that this was this was not exclusively um, the the enslaved people in the Mediterranean slave trade were not primarily Black Africans, right? And but that doesn't sort of undercut his argument because part of what he's trying to do is actually make the case that capitalism is racial because capitalism emerges from a feudal order that was already suffused with racialism. Effectively, that Europeans were racializing themselves before they had any interest in racializing Africans, and that the first racial subjects were the Irish, the Roma, the Slavs. So there are all of these different ways in which Robinson is also kind of retelling, he's retelling the history of capitalism, he's also retelling the history of race in kind of Western European modernity. Um, and then in doing so, drawing these connections between this sort of emergence of um, a Mediterranean slave trade and then the emergence of the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I really like that. And um, I, I also think to add on to that, that there, uh, one of the things you push against Susan and Bradell is the tendency has to um, construct too tight a unity of, of the Mediterranean world, to think the Mediterranean world as a kind of unified um, 
object. And I think the same could be said sometimes in some extensions of Robinson's work um, to think of racial capitalism as too unified a category. And so your emphasis on, on American Mediterraneans, plural, and your effort to kind of pluralize the space that right all tends to, to unify, I think can, can teach us something too about how to think racial capitalism in um, this period and in the Americas. Certainly um, slavery in, for instance, the Yucatan, a place that I work in, uh, is, is very different than it is in the Caribbean. It's very different than it is in um, North America and in the US. And so, so um, pluralizing our understandings of slaveries um, and therefore understanding the incredible flexibility that racial capitalism has within its, within its kind of uh, punitive unity. Uh, I think that th that's, that's like a, a project that you're also pro provoking us to, to take on. Um, and, and if, if we can construct too unified a sense of what enslavement and slavery means and what racial capitalism is, then we lose track of, for instance, incredible diversity of black life that flourishes uh, in resistance to enslavement, um, as well as the dynamic interplays with uh, indigenous lives uh, in, in all these different regions. So, so that, that's one of the ways that I really uh, appreciate your, your, especially that final part of your book. I think that David in bringing up, David and Camila in bringing up Italy as her locus and David the Yucatan also brings up what I'm, why the American Mediterraneans are useful as a comparative otherwise. You know, that's the way to kind of, the, the, the devil's way out um, of that conundrum is that it allows you to look at unequal units. You know, I think David might have quoted that, but Italy and the Yucatan as a sec as a region, that whole question and problem, and what is the Caribbean? Is it a series of different nations? Is it an archipelago? Those kinds of questions. Um, their two locations of study also explain the utility of thinking multiple Mediterraneans. David's question of, and Camila's really too, now, why the American Mediterraneans now? Yeah. I think, we'll go back. Why does it, as he say, hibernate? I think that's a really good um, image. It, it definitely appears to correlate to, it's those high water, high water marks or high octane moments are moments of racial crisis yeah. um, globally. And, the or nationally or both. And it appears to emerge at these moments when racial crisis is occurring of different kinds. Correspondingly, it goes away, it dissipates, it, it, it hibernates when there's this kind of what we would call now post-racial view of things. So in the 1890s in the United States, we all know there's the ideal of the colorblind constitution. And that's what lay behind Plessy versus Ferguson, the, uh, the Supreme Court decision of 1896. Um, and the, that colorblindness goes all the way, or putative colorblindness goes all the way up to um, what the, Anthropologist Stefan Palmier, who's a, an anthropologist of Afro-Cuban religions, he has a new um, book coming out on Caribbean Mediterraneans. And one of the things that he brought uh, that he mentions is it's on Ortiz. I brought several new ideas here just to um, be able to read to you. Um, he, he thinks of Ortiz, the whole book is, is really dedicated to Ortiz, um, the, the author of Cuban Counterpoint. Um, and that what he's, what Palmier says, it's about how the answer to this point is how much post-raciality has been, a, has a long history. And you can track it in part because the American Mediterraneans wouldn't emerge during those periods. I mean, and this is just a thesis. It's a speculation that's you know, maybe what I'm best at. Um, Palmier's argument is just that the overarching argument, he says, is that a return to Ortiz's signature contributions to rethinking ethno-racial difference and non-hierarchical conceptions of cultural heterogeneity may serve us well in our contemporary endeavors 
to understand not just the Caribbean and Mediterranean regions, but global processes such as the turn toward vocabularies of cultural incompatibility that serve as novel, seemingly post-racial technologies of exclusion. And I think it's that kind of emergence of an, an analysis of the putatively post-racial vocabularies, discourses, and claims of our own moment that makes it very right for the emergence of the American Mediterraneans. Another one is something that Camila and I are gonna work on for a, um, a Washington Post um, column called Made History or History Made, um, which is the impulse, which what some of us might see as unholy or unkosher, to compare the crisis of Ukrainian refugees to the North African Mediterranean refugee crisis. And I don't know if either one of you wants to say anything about that, but there was actually a, a, a paper, an article in the today's New York Times about a, um, a boatload of Tunisian refugees that, that was lost. And the end of the article has a series of dizzying um, numerical comparisons to year by year, how many Ukrainian refugees there are now and how many over time since 2016, the quote unquote height of the Mediterranean refugee crisis to see what kind of conclusions you can draw from those numbers. It reminded me of how the comparative impulse, which we all in many ways despise and turn away from is so ubiquitous. It's so hard to get, get around. Um, and that we need to figure out ways to talk about it that are speculative, that, that acknowledge the numbers and the need for the quantification and do more than that as well or jump off from the numbers. Um, I don't know if you have any ideas about that, but I, that is one that I think is really important about why now. Well, if I can, if I can just jump in with two things, um, you know, first, Susan, the, the point that you make about the, you know, the significance of the Mediterranean and and sort of the in the sort of context of discourses of post racialism is one that's really fascinating, in part because you know many of the ways that I have encountered the Mediterranean has to do with so so as we know right again as you say the mediterranean always functions as a racial metaphor but sometimes the metaphor is one of post racialism colorblindness hybridity um, particularly in the Italian case, right? Something that I see again and again and again in sort of liberal politics is the sense that, um, you know, Italians are not quite are not quite white and therefore incapable of racism, that they have some kind of natural affinity or closeness to Africans. Um, and even that, you know, there, there's, this, there's also something I'm interested in thinking about in the future are the, the relationship between Mediterranean discourses of hybridity and lusotropicalism as well, because there's a way that Italians all, often reference an idealized vision of Brazilian racial democracy as an alternative to what is seen as an excessive American focus on race. And again, this is where the connection between the Mediterranean and the Caribbean is so useful. The Caribbean helps us to understand that creolization, metissage, hybridity, right, is not innocence, that, that intimacies can be violent, right, and that we have to understand processes, the, the conditions of possibility for processes of creolization, which in many cases, right, are, are um, rooted in, right, or inextricable from violence. Um, but, you know, to the question of, of comparison and, you know, how we understand the, the refugee crisis in Ukraine and how that connects to the Mediterranean, um, and we've talked about this, right, but there's a way that what is happening um, at, for example, the, the Ukraine, the sort of Ukraine-Poland border is, can it's sort of unintelligible without the sort of shadow comparison to the Mediterranean. And, you know, I always think back to one of my, my mentors um, from grad school, Jillian Hart, who really 
sort of warned us against comparison for the ways that it relies upon bounded, sort of reified bounded units of space and pushed us toward what she called relational comparison, right? Which is not to treat two sites as separate, but actually to think about how they are produced in relation to one another, right? So how is it that the anti-Black racial violence of the Mediterranean actually makes possible the, um, the sort of disproportionate um, uh, accommodating and welcoming response to refugees. In other words, how do we think about the ways that these different kinds of borders and spaces are actually produced in relation to each other? And again, I see that that's what you were, you know, that's also what you're doing, right? Your work is not a bounded comparison, but it's thinking about how these Mediterraneans are always being produced in relation to each other through Right, to David's point, the actual material circulation, right, of infrastructure and ideas and, and literatures and modes of study. You go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking, but you go ahead. Well, let me just, one, one thing was um, that the notion that Italians are not quite right, white and therefore can't really be racist that is another really interesting way to think about this putative discourse of post-raciality. You know, what is it doing? Why does it work? Why do you need the comparison? You can't make that statement either without thinking about, well, who else is white? Um, and who else is called explicitly not white? Both of those, where the Italians would be in the middle of that. Um, and then I think that Luzo, um, the Luzo Tropical, that's really interesting um, as another intermediate term. I think probably these, the ways of thinking comparatively on a continuum, instead of polarized, you know, X versus Y, that would be the bounded units. But comparison is useful if you think about points on a continuum. Um, and that is another way or multidimensionality. Um, you know, which could be the 3D version of that. Um, and I think you get, I think, again, you get that relational idea. Um, you know, it is worth mentioning just that, that Lisance, the, the Caribbean, the discourse entier um, is Caribbean discourse, but the second work, which is where he makes a lot of the Mediterranean Caribbean comparisons is called um, Poetics of Relation. So we really could do something with, well, what is relationality? Whose is it? Where is it? When is it invoked? And if yeah. I could just add one quick thing about Glissant, we relation, the, you know, relation is, relation exists in relation to opacity. And I think that's really important to yeah. the opacity piece. Yeah, but also um, like your, the way you just talked about relation, Camila, is, is even more, uh, expensive than that. And it reminds me um, to think about like, if American Mediterraneans names a method, right, um, of, of studying not just, as you said, Camila, two discrete units, um, or a series of units in relationship to, to a discrete object of comparison, but rather relations among, among places, then we can think about, like, for instance, the work of, of a, a, another sadly departed dear friend of mine, Maria Elena Martinez, on the traffic of racial thinking in early modern Iberia to simultaneously both South Asia and the Americas, um, the category of Casta, you know, yeah, cook, cooked yeah, up in, yeah. in Iberia in the, in the proper Mediterranean world, brought uh, by the colonizers to to these antipodes, you know, uh, South Asia and the Americas at the same moment, reworked in those places, fed back into Europe and, and picked up there. That is like the phrase American Mediterraneans doesn't come up in that work, but that is exactly the method that you're proposing and the method that Camila's spotlighting with this focus on, on relations, right? Uh, the category of casta, you know, isn't just something that we should think of as, as analogous to race in the US. It's actually a, a name for a mode of racial thinking that is that travels the world, circulates the world, and is reworked in each place and fed back, right? And so I think that, you know, again, this is a great example of, of like proposing a method that's well beyond comparison that's, uh, that, that's attended to relationality. Um, I'm also thinking too about um, that this is a method 
that we would need to be able to understand like the Black legend. Uh, I have a former student, Evelyn Soto, who's doing great yes. work on, um, on the traffic of the Black legend in the Americas. And uh, that's another term that, uh, that is, is infinitely com compared, like relation, right? Um, and is re recrafted and reworked uh, in all the places and spots that you are talking about, that you both are talking about. Um, uh, and kept alive through a kind of an American Mediterraneanism, I, again, if we think of it as a method. You know, one thing that, that um, I, one question that I would have, just thinking about the translational aspects of all of these, we haven't really talked about it as much as, um, as we could, but you can't do everything. I wonder what, what was the word Costa? How is it used in South Asia? You know, is it translated? Is there a cognate? Yeah, cast. I mean, it becomes the English it, word it, cast and, and, and is worked in a different way in, in British colonial um, racial thinking than it is in like 17th century, 18th, I should say 18th century Spanish American thinking. Um, and uh, but or, originally it's a term that helps them mark the in Iberia before the conquest is a term that helps to mark the difference between Jews, Muslims, yes. and Christians. Yeah. Uh, around the question of uh, purity of blood or libiasa de sangre. So, so it, if it starts there and then it's carried over and then fed back in, it, it's finding its way into the world that Camila is working on um, too, right? Um, after having left the proper Mediterranean, circulated through South Asia and the Americas and then gone back into the Mediterranean, right? And that would be an example of where the colonial language, English, is the translation or the, we don't want to call it a translation. I think that's another part of this whole, uh, the, the whole question that we're talking about, what is the language dimension? Um, so whose relation, what, what kind of relationality, how does that um, travel across languages? Um, and even when they're, the word is the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Roland is here to say, open it up to the audience. <laughs> I am loath to jump into this conversation because it's going so beautifully and I don't want to derail it. Uh, but yes, I'm here to say perhaps we can uh, transition briefly into taking some questions from, from the audience and, uh, and you know, let's take advantage of the fact that we've got three, three figures here, not only the author of the book in question, Susan, but, but, but uh, Camila and David, and see if we could uh, uh, try to, you know, everybody can try to address these questions as best you can. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because we really only have about 12, 12 or 13 minutes to do this. So um, uh, uh, let me begin with by, by trying to synthesize a couple of things that come up in the Q&A. Um, one of them is, uh, I might be thought of as a, a, a deep historical question paired with a presentist question. So first, the deep historical question, and I'm going to address this specifically to Susan because of the book. Uh, and it, I guess what the question invites you to do is to pull out the classical thread of this project. So I pose the question this way. In what way are you describing uh, a, 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 a metaphor that might be understood as an episode in the long history of Western classicism, by which I think we mean the use of Greek and Roman antiquity as a way of commenting on the present, whatever present we happen to occupy. Could you sort of isolate for us for a moment the classicist dimension of your argument? Thank you. That, that is a, such a great question because it goes back to Black Spartacus right. and James's use of that figure. And it also addresses one of the questions that I can see in the chat which is what is the directionality of this, um, of what would sometimes be called in the world of classicism, the translatio imperii, yes. the assumption that the influence moves westward. And I think one answer that I would give, and I would love to hear what Camila and David have to say, but it's that, first of all, in the American Mediterraneans, the direction by and large and this would count, I think, in the world of Black classicism, including Black Spartacus, that it's often a direction of negation or in contrast to. So I use as the epigraph to the book and I, um, an epigraph that Baudel also uses, you know, this is the idea of recycling and genealogical work um, by Jose de Acosta, 
um, talking about there have not yet to this day, there have not yet been any Mediterraneans found in Africa, Europe, etc. I don't remember the exact terms, but many, much of the time, what you're learning from these, this metaphor, particularly in Black classicism, is the way the classical models don't fit. That would be one thing to say. So in contrast to another one that is really interesting that I haven't done as much work on that I think we could, is which, black, which classical world is invoked? Yes. That is Greco or Roman. And it by and large, James's world, so among the Caribbean classicists, James uses the Roman world by and large. He does talk about Greece too. There's no question about that. But one of the points of the blog that Christian Hoaxberg has written for us is to say one of the un, the un, understudied connections is to the is to Rome with the legacy of slave revolt. Um, the other figure of um, the Mediterranean of the 1980s, Walcott, he sees a Homeric America and it's a kind of mm -hmm. perhaps not seamless, but there's a continuity going in the direction of the translatio imperii. So I think I would be interested in just the idea of which, which classical world is invoked under which black classical tradition and banner. Um, Emily Greenwood has some terrific work on black classicism. We're hoping to post some of that on the Colloquy's website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it Appreciate reminds me too of uh, really interesting work on the, how to read um, the classicism of the names of enslaved people in North America. Um, Caesar is such a common name of enslaved people not just from the perspective of the enslavers who assert a kind of classical justification of slavery, but also from the perspective of subaltern people who, who maintain those names and rework them, you know, paleomimically. And so that's another angle we could think about this. And also interested in um, work that uh, people like Max Tomba uh, are doing on the, the, the way uh, in the 17th, 18th century, a whole new class of slave law was cre created and, the, and, and given uh, Roman, given Latin names like Terminalius and all these categories that didn't exist in Roman law at all, but are given Roman names to make it seem like they're ancient Roman legal kind of categories, but they're actually just entirely new, made up by, by, by colonizers and enslavers to uh, invent histories of colonization and enslavement that justify their own position. So, you know, I think we're, we need your American Mediterraneans to think through those relations uh, as Camille puts it too. Okay, now here is the presentist side of the question from the audience and I'm gonna interpret it as follows. Uh, and I know that Susan and Camila have already said a little bit about this, but I think the, the, the point of the question I think is to invite you to uh, focus specifically on, on this one thing. Uh, what is the state of the metaphor today? And I, and I think we mean really today. That is, um, you know, Camila mentioned present day conditions in the real Mediterranean that are um, uh, so challenging and so, um, um, so full of meanings that would not have been the case 50 years ago. Um, what, what could, and this, I think this is a question that all three of you can comment on, but I'm gonna throw it to Susan first. The, the, the state of the metaphor at this present moment. I think I would really want to say that it shouldn't be a metaphor anymore. <laughs> you know, that it's that it is when we use the term Mediterranean, it's used in all of these different titles. What is it actually referring to? What place, what time? What does it mean when you call North African refugees the, the part of the Mediterranean crisis? What material history, you know, is being both revealed in, and in some way um, veiled by that kind of language. I think that I resist the idea of it as a metaphor. It's used that way, the California use of it and the secondary sources on it, the secondary sources I consider to be just as much a part of the whole history. But so um, Kevin Starr has a terrific book on the American Mediterranean in camp in California. And it's about the Stanford University campus 
he thinks of it as a metaphor, but the best parts of what he writes on is the way Frederick Law Olmsted um, and David Starr Jordan got together and disagreed and agreed on what to do to make the campus a recreation of a, Mediter of a Mediterranean place. And now there's an unforeseen future, I think, to that, a material future of what Mediterranean might mean for the campus, which is that David Starr Jordan's name, like so many names, have been disappeared yeah. from the building called Jordan Hall. I didn't use slides because I just feel like it's, we would rather have an interactive presence of all of us, but it's really striking to see that em empty space. I consider that to be a Mediterranean, a material Mediterranean future or, you know, of what it once was now present. If I can just throw in an addendum from the audience to that, to the point you just made about the um, um, annulment of this as a metaphor or the, 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 you know, the obsolescence of this as a metaphor, uh, quote, I believe that Mediterranean studies are having a revival right now because Mediterraneans themselves, Sicilians, Greeks, former Yugoslavs, Turks, are finally writing themselves, they're speaking for themselves, calling for solidarity. So that's part of the presentist question as well. What else is interesting about that? The collection that David is in, I mean, this is not, um, this is an academic book, but the one that's called so provocatively an Armenian Mediterranean, wanna say anything about the interlocutors in there? Well, yeah, for that project, it's similar. For they tried to use the um, the editors of the collection tried to use the Mediterranean frame as a um, as a method to to look at uh, this wider space. This we, we might some some in area studies might call an Ottoman space um, from an Armenian angle, right? And so um, so to connect previously disconnected or in in the most extreme case. Um, genocided people yeah, yeah. Um, back into the Mediterranean world. And so, you know, from, from that angle, for instance, the, the um, Turkish Mediterranean is not underrepresented, it's overrepresented, right? Um, and, uh, and there never was a shortage of, of Turkish writing into the Mediterranean, but there has been, there have been other shortages. So, so I think that, you know, the, it's, it's an interesting project that also tries to think about the category methodologically. Um, it's not obviously the word Mediterranean just a metaphor, but uh, we can't deny the fact that it continues to assert itself on all of us metaphorically. Um, we can't wish that away. So that's what I really appreciate about your work, like taking that, that seriously and on board. But just I, yeah, Camila, to yeah. say, well, yeah, definitely Camila, the, the person who asked that question that you did a, a nice paraphrase of says, um, that they are uncomfortable with the, using the term that, that metaphor, and I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's all over the literature. So you have to, that's the great part about thinking of this as the literature itself is a kind of intervention. They are all, everyone is a part of the history of the using of this term, including the people who just think they're reporting on it yeah. in a kind of neutral way. Yeah. So Camila, go. Oh, please, Camille. Yeah, I, I agree. So the, the critique of metaphor is really important. This is something that I've that I've written about in my work, right? We see um, you know, the the sort of the Mediterranean becoming a, a sort of metaphor in the ways that aerial photographs of migrant ships become juxtaposed with um, you know, the diagram of the slave ship brooks, or even the way that in um, political theory, the abstracted figure of the migrant crossing the Mediterranean becomes a symbol for a particular kind of outer national politics in ways that is then disconnected from the material lived reality of what it means to be a refugee crossing the Mediterranean. But that being said, you know, like I think both David and Susan are saying, we have to continue tend with the political uses of the met of the Mediterranean as this polyvalent metaphor. And this is something that, you know, I in my book I have a chapter where I sort of track the different ways that the Mediterranean gets used to 
map the boundary line between Europe and Africa. And I saw that there was a, a question about not generalizing Italians. And I certainly do not, because what is at stake precisely um, is the fact that the boundary line between Europe and Africa, between Italy and the Mediterranean has constantly been shifting. So at some points, that boundary line divides Northern and Southern Italians. Under fascism, Italians get sort of racially incorporated as one singular aerial Mediterranean race as a way of distinguishing them from the colonies in the African continent. The way that I see the Mediterranean being used today, there's sort of these dual, well, there, there's a sort of, there, it's, a, it's a sort of trivalent metaphor, right? So on the one hand, right, the right invokes the Mediterranean as a site of dangerous racial contamination and invasion. Right. On the other hand, right, there are these efforts to reclaim the Mediterranean by looking to the past, what I describe as sort of, you know, unearthing from the murky seafloor sediments, right, these histories of exchange that become a sort of counterpoint to the violent fortification of the Mediterranean in the present, which, you know, in many ways, I think is problematic because it does sort of reproduce the kind of romanticism that we're trying to move away from. And what I find most interesting and exciting, right, is these reimaginings of the Mediterranean as a site of struggle, right? As a site through which new kinds of political solidarities can be articulated on the basis of sort of shared critiques of racial capitalism and colonialism. And so, you know, to the, the last person, um, the last question that I see in the chat here, you know, I wanna also suggest that we stretch the way that we think about current um, narrations of the Mediterranean and remember that when we talk about the Mediterranean, it's not just the European side or the northern or eastern side of the Mediterranean, right? That the Mediterranean is also Africa. And rearticulating those connections is critically important for also challenging the colonial bifurcation, right, of northern Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. So this, this, this newer vision of the Mediterranean as a site of struggle is actually about articulating solidarities, right, between the northern and southern parts of the Mediterranean that have been wrenched apart, right, because of the imposition of these violent racial geographies. Wonderful, thank you. One of the earlier, like really quickly, one of the earlier questions actually mentions um, colonial work on the Islamic Mediterranean, mm -hmm. yes. and that, and it's not contemporary, but it is, in the sense that she's, the, the, and that it, within medieval studies, you know, I know this just from my very good colleague Sharon Kinoshita um, at Santa Cruz. Medieval studies is looking at the Mediterranean as that exactly the Islamic Mediterranean, the Arabic Mediterranean. So looking North Africa and Eastern Mediterranean is really coming to the fore. Maybe that's a reason, you know, why this is another fertile moment. That's not the out. That's not the real world that we're talking about. But that's re really important. And I, I think her name was Robin Pinto, who mentions her own work on the Islamic Mediterranean. Karen Pinto. Yeah. Karen, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question, and it obviously goes to Susan. Uh, uh, you, you were a fellow at the Humanities Center in the mid-90s. Um, I think it was the year after I was a fellow at the Humanities Center. I think that's when I first met you. And um, after that, of course, you published Blood Talk. Um, and now here's this book. Uh, could you tell us what, what uh, how do you draw the line from what you were thinking about uh, when you were a fellow at the center to what's happening in this book? I was so always interested in fringe figures, outre figures. So Madame Blavatsky, um, a you know notorious occultist um, of the of the turn of the century, and that was the American race melodramas and the culture of the occult. At what I was so interested in during those that year, those early nineties, culminating in that year at, at the Humanities Center, and it in part had to do with the way race was being talked about and there were our, our own versions of um, white supremacy mm -hmm. uh, and occultisms that were being brooded about at that time and the way I picked up on that had to do with being interested in these fringe figures um, in the long history of the quote-unquote race melodrama which has so many of the same polyvalent characteristics that we are talking about it was it was practiced by, you know, anyone could do it. It was a highly protean, 
Um, and the Humanity Center was the place that I was thinking about occultism. So that's whatever, whether that's a, a, a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> it was really that. Um, there were a lot of people at the time um, doing popular culture and that also yes, right. is part of my work. So um, there's another one, one of my very good colleagues at Santa Cruz, again, Velashvi Kupan, was a, um, a graduate student um, fellow then. That's she right. loved Star Wars and was interested <laughs> always in thinking about histories of Star Wars. It was so, there was a lot of fertile work at the time that you can really trace maybe, you know, in a zigzag to mm -hmm. the present. Great, thank you so much. And uh, uh, as we wrap up here on behalf of the center and on behalf of, uh, of uh, the audience, let me thank Camila Hawthorne, David Kazanjian, and most of all, Susan Gilman for a wonderful uh, conversation. I should also thank uh, Christian Hogsberg uh, who contributed a blog post. And I, I should say, we hope the conversation continues. To the audience, I'd say go to the arcade go to arcade.stanford.edu, go look at that blog post by Hoaxberg, comment on it. Uh, your comments may be um, addressed by the author or by Susan Gilman or by someone else, and you can continue the conversation. And especially keep an eye out for the new colloquy called Mediterraneans that we will uh, launch shortly, probably in a week or two, and it will include some of the materials that have been discussed here and mentioned in passing. And it will be a place where people can uh, submit their own their own uh, work and their own comments on what's already there. So thank you all for this. Um, everyone who registered for today's event was entered into a drawing to receive one of three copies of American Mediterraneans. And so I would like to announce the winners, Carol Farina, Cameron Bushnell, and Louise Dibble. We will be in touch shortly by email uh, about getting the book to you. Thank you again to so many of you. Uh, I'm looking at the audience, not only nationwide, but worldwide that have joined us today. I hope many of you can return on, on Thursday, June 2nd, that's exactly a week from today, at 4 p.m. Pacific, either in person at the center or online for our last public lecture of this academic year. The political theorist Adam Gatachu of the University of Chicago will speak on the universal race Garveyism and the practices of Pan-Africanism. As always, details are available on our website, shc.stanford.edu. So from all of us here at the center, thank you and until next time.